It's good to see you all. I know many of you have traveled a long, long way to be here. Um, and some of you have been round Transylvania for the last few days, and I, I know you enjoyed that. Um, this morning will be easy. It is a very relaxed nice, session, session, session before we start the normal stuff. stuff this afternoon. Um, and uh, in the middle of the afternoon, there will be a um, the opening ceremony, the, the, the formal opening ceremony, uh, which will take place in the church next door. It will be very exciting because all the local religious leaders uh, will be joining us. The Minister of State for Religious Affairs will be joining us and uh, everybody will be getting dressed up. That doesn't mean you have to get dressed up. It just means it just means they will be getting dressed up. Um, so that that will be the formal opening, and uh, we're hoping it will be a very splendid affair. But for this morning, uh, um, as I say, a lot of it is about getting to know each other, and it's also about getting to know Transylvania. Um, so I'm pleased. I've lost him already. Um, he has a very, um, what should I say, Transylvanian name that I cannot pronounce. So I just call him Norby. Uh, and he's going to spend some time just telling you about the history of Transylvania and, and, and the uh, Unitarian Church here. So I'm going to hand over to him um, and let him um, tell us all about where we are. Um, and then we'll move on. Norby, welcome. I prepared a short presentation in which I'm going to talk to you about the history of the place we are uh, in Romania called Transylvania, and also about my church, the Hungarian Unitarian Church, and Unitarianism here in Transylvania. Robert said that this session will be easy. Well, I'm going to disappoint you. It's not. Because even the title itself is misleading. Because when you look at, well, if you would be able to look at the presentation, you would see Transylvania, land of religious freedom. And then you would think to yourself, well, where is that? I heard about Transylvania with vampires and Dracula. And many might have think that Transylvania only exists in horror movies, movies, and in Bram Stoker's work. Well, it does. Do. Transylvania is an actual place, and do not be afraid, we don't fight next. Transylvania is uh, the land which is in the Carpathian Basin. I have a little picture of it. I'm very sorry that, that I see it, but maybe you will be you are able to see it shortly. It is part of Romania now, the country that you have, that of which border you have passed when you came here. It hasn't been always like that. For a major part of the, its history, Transylvania was part of the Kingdom of Hungary. For a short amount of time, it was a separate political entity. And for the past 100 and something years, it has been part of Romania. Now, if you look at the political map of the world, you will not be able to find Transylvania as a separate unit. But it does exist. It does exist as a historical territory. And when we Unitarians talk about the place which we call home, we will usually talk about Transylvania because that is the place that we feel is our. So Transylvania is situated in Central Eastern Europe. It is bordered to the east and to the south by the Carpathian Mountains. To the west, it is uh, it goes into the plains of uh, uh, Hungary. It is a multi-ethnic uh, place many, many uh, people and languages and religions, and it is also the birthplace of Unitarianism 
and the religious gatherings. Um, when we talked about what should, what the emphasis of this presentation should be, I have been requesting it. Talk about the history of religious freedom that is linked to Transylvania. So my primary focus will be on that during this presentation. But just to put you into context of this very, very strange place, I will try to say a couple of things about its history as well. So yes, this is just a very, very general outlook of its history. And it's even hard to decide where to start from. Because we could start in the stone when the first inhabitants of these lands stepped foot in uh, the forests between the Garbadian mountains. But still, I have decided to start from a point where we enter medieval or our times and medieval history, and this is the Hungarian conquest of the Carpathian Basin, which happened in the 9th century. In 1002 AD, Transylvania became part of the Kingdom of Hungary, the Christian Kingdom of Hungary. This is, these are the times and the years when Hungary, or when Stephen, first king of Hungary, uh, accepted Western type of Christianity as his own, and he uh, baptized the Hungarian to become part of Hungary. Basically, a little while after that, this part of the world, Transylvania, has become part of the kingdom of Hungary, inhabited then mostly by Hungarians. In the 16th century, the uh, catastrophe happened. At the Battle of Mohács, the medieval kingdom of Hungary was defeated. And basically, this uh, kingdom was no longer present on the map of Europe. You had several different entities, political entities, that followed up. The central part of the Kingdom of Hungary was under Ottoman rule. The eastern part of the Kingdom of Hungary became a separate principality, which was basically a vassal state of the Ottoman Empire, yet it was considered to be separate and somewhat independent. This is what we call the Principality of Transylvania. The northern and western parts of the former Kingdom of Hungary were basically a disputed territory in the Habsburg Chip Empire, Ottoman Empire, with majority of Hungarian speakers there. So from 1570 onward, after the Battle of Mohács, here comes a years of tension when it's very hard to decide what we see in Transylvania. That is also the formation of the Hungarian Unitarian Church and the Unitarianism in Transylvania in general, but that's another story. But from the second part of the 16th century onward, almost to the end of the 17th century, Transylvania is a separate municipality and the country, a separate country in Europe, in a very, very particular uh, space and situation. It is situated between large empires who are constantly at war with yeah. each other. The Ottoman Empire and the Habsburgic Empire. And both empires, they play on these lands. Both of them say that they want these lands to be theirs. So for the Principality of Transylvania, it was always a necessity to try to find the balance between the two great empires in order to exist. By the end of the 17th century, that was already impossible. Uh, Transylvania became part of the Habsburgic Empire. It became uh, the principality, but it was part of the empire already. So it lost its independent status, and it was part of the Habsburgic Empire all through the centuries that followed. In 1848, at the Hungarian Revolution, the Great Hungarian Revolution of the mid 19th century, one of the, one of the things that they wished, the revolutionaries wished, was the union between Hungary and Transylvania. So Transylvania would again be part 
of the state for but the revolution was defeated and he had spurged the empire we returned to them sold these lands as if nothing as that but history turned shortly and by the second part of the 19th century when the austro-hungarian compromise uh, was signed and written then transylvania became part of the king of the state of hungary again so it's very very popular from 1867 until 1920 uh, transylvania was part of Hungary. after the first world war when the treaty of Trianon in paris was signed transylvania became part of the Romania. Before or during the Second World War, some parts of Transylvania were given back to Hungary. Some parts remained in Romania. After the Second World War, those northern parts given back to Hungary became part of Romania again. And this is how it is in this state. So if you feel that your head is spinning around through the empires changing status and Transylvania becoming part of ever-changing countries, don't worry. Our head spin around as well when we think about this. But this is part of who we are. This is part of our tradition and it shapes also our character. This uh, ever-changing liquidity of history that we seem to see all around us. And it also teaches us a very important lesson that that almost 500 years ago was also the known lesson for the people living here. It is the idea of tolerance. It is the idea of acceptance. The idea that we should not undermine and try to destroy others or the language that they speak, or the way they worship, or the way they live. It's much more important to try to understand them, find somehow, and sometimes this is very hard, peace. And the place for everybody to live. Uh, now, who are the inhabitants of this uh, country for transiting? Well, it, you know, every saying points their hands towards themselves. We have this Hungarian saying, which means that everyone will put themselves forward at some time. So I think he's, I'm an ethnic Hungarian, so I will start with the Hungarians that we had the principles. Hungarians came here from uh, Asia. Uh, they were a nomadic uh, tribe or a conglomeration of tribes that came to Europe and the Carpathian lesson and settled here. Um, Hungarians have been living here for uh, for centuries. We have a very long culture of our living here in uh, Transylvania and Hungary as well. Even though at this present moment we are the minority, not only in Transylvania as a cultural and historical place, but also in Romania. At this moment, there are around 1,100,000 Hungarians living in Romania. Romania has around 90 million inhabitants. So you can see we are a very small minority. But the culture and the heritage and the history that that even Transylvania, something that shapes us, is foundational for us. It's not just some roots that we have and that we can cut off these other parts of the world. For us, being a Hungarian Transylvania is something definitive. It is as definitive as is our religion. And we cannot choose between the two of them. They work together and would shape us together, show us who we are. Not only the Unitarians, but also the Roman Catholics, the Reform, and the Lutherans that make you in. Transylvania and define themselves as Hungarians. The vast majority of the inhabitants of the country called Romania and the territory called Transylvania, this former, are Romanians. 
And history is a hard thing to say. Um, there is this childish debate uh, that keeps on going, and it's not uh, made by children, but by adults, scholars, on who was first to inhabit these lands, Hungarians or Romanians. This will never stop, because this is not history. This is ideology. And because it's ideology, then you will always have people saying the other version of this. We do not actually know how and when Romanians appear here in this part of the world called Transylvania. The Romanians will say that the Romanians are the primordial inhabitants of these lands. They say they are a mixture of the Dashin people, the tribes that lived here in the first centuries uh, of the modern era, and the Romans that conquered that con these the lands. And, and from this mixture, mixture came the Romanian people who have been inhabitants of these lands for thousands of years. Now, I'm not going to go into the details. Others will not say this. They will say that Romanians appear from the south of the Danube River, uh, and they entered the southern parts of what is called now uh, Romania, to the south of the Carpathian Mountains. And after that, you mean the 12th century, they started to migrate northward to the territory that we call Transylvania and started to inhabit in lands. Whatever the situation might be, Romanians are a foundational nationality and group, which, which uh, also uh, shapes the character of Transylvania. And we have Saxons, German-speaking people, who were pulled in from Germany, from every part of Germany by the Hungarian kings, who built cities and towns here in Transylvania. They were given lands and privileges by the Hungarian kings to do so. So they settled in Transylvania, and they were very important for, trans for the history of Transylvania. This city that you are in, Kolozsva, is also called Klausen, which is the German name for Kolozsva. Kolozsva is the Hungarian name. Klausenburg is the German name. And Nurs and Nursnapoka are the Romanian names. Just to show you how wonderful our history is, but if you want to speak in Latin, then you might call it Claudiopolis, or if you do not like uh, uh, that wording and you might like a more Yiddish name for the city, then you can draw all it for its center. And so even the names of our cities, towns, and villages show this diversity of nations living with that. So the Saxons uh, came here in waves. The first settlers were Teutonic knights that settled in the southern part of Transylvania. And then for centuries, waves and waves of German speaking people came here to Transylvania, built beautiful cities, and they were exceptional merchants um, who had a lot to give uh, to the history of Transylvania. Now, their tragedy happened in the second part of the 20th century, during communist period, when the dictator of uh, Romania called Nicolae Ceausescu, I think he's uh, quite famous internationally or influence internationally, uh, the dictator of Romania, Nikolai Ceausescu, uh, decided to basically sell the German-speaking people to Germany. So they were given the option to leave everything behind, and the West German state paid a sum to Romania in order to let the Saxon people leave Transylvania. And it was good business. So the majority of the of the Saxon German speaking people obviously when they had this chance to meet this extremely hard times that were here in Transylvania and did that. They migrated, they went to Germany, and they left everything behind. So when you now visit the old Saxon villages in Transylvania, especially the villages, you will see huge in large houses that are in terrible stages because they are not inhabited. 
you will see fortified churches with strong walls and bastions and with hundreds and hundreds of years of history behind them. Without windows, without roofs, collapse because the people who built those in churches in left. And only in cemeteries, you will see tombstones of people with German names written on them. But you will not hear German words on the streets of the Spinaches. It's basically your people report sexes. Do not do not longer have Transylvania. We have had Jewish people living in Transylvania for centuries. And the tolerance that seems to be part of Transylvania shows in this aspect as well. Even in the 17th century, when, when intolerance toward the Jewish people was present in every European country, here in Transylvania, Jewish people were permitted to even settle, which was something that did not happen in many European countries of the time. They were merchants, primarily. They, uh, they brought goods from different uh, parts, and they also shaped who we are. They also shaped us religiously. Because at some point in our history, just to make even more complicated, there were groups of Hungarian ethnic in some our Unitarian faith migrated toward the ways the Jewish people worship and believe and became secular uh, people, or, I mean, the Hungarian people who had Jewish ways to continue their lives. Unfortunately, they are no longer pressed on the map of people living in Chelsea. We had Armenians, we have our Armenians uh, living here, who migrated from their own lands in the East because they were persecuted them. And they slowly, as merchants, arrived to Transylvania, and because they received them, they felt welcome here, they settled. We have large communities in many parts of Transylvania, they have been sent around the town of Beach and so on, which were built by these Armenians. We have Roma, who also came from uh, and from the south. They, their history is, uh, is a history of pain, a uh, history of injustice, because they were considered for many centuries as second hand citizens, second hand people. We have basically any rights. And we have Slavians, also Germans. Well, was settled in the western and northern parts of Transylvania in the 17th and 18th century. Also, both worked the land, built towns and cities, and who also, Roger, also left Transylvania in the second part of the, the 20th century. And the list would go on and on before the nationalities and smaller and larger groups, and we could subdivide these groups into subdivisions and uh, or ethnic groups among the larger nationality, but that would make it too complicated for this ease presentation that Robert wanted to have today. Are you still awake? But, but is your head spinning up? Okay, so that's complicated. Let's talk about religions. Now, this is something that uh, makes things interesting. I'm going to talk about the present situation here, and afterwards, I'm going to talk a little bit about the history because how that's how your death deals. And I'm going to start with the largest denomination at this moment, which is a Orthodox denomination. I have put in brackets the majority of the worshipers of those different denominations. It doesn't mean that there are other people in that denomination that are not of that nationality. But the majority of that nationality is represented by the people or the nation putting practice. The Orthodox uh, Church makes up uh, 90% of Romanian society. Romania is one of the most religious uh, countries in Europe and in the Western world. 90 something percent, percent of its inhabitants said that they were religious and they considered themselves Christian. So this is a very, very religious place uh, where we work. And uh, 
very religious part of this very religious uh, place is uh, the Orthodox part. The Romanian Orthodox Church is not only a religious power, it's also a political power. And it has been a political power in this country, and especially among the Romanian nationals, for many, many years, maybe even centuries. If you look, when you make, some of you have visited the Transylvania, you have seen a lot of new Orthodox churches being built all around Transylvania. They are uh, uh, expect the churches and the congregations, uh, Orthodox churches and congregations here in Transylvania. Another large, uh, et, uh, I mean, religious group and uh, denomination living here are the Roman Catholics. Now we have Roman Catholics who are ethnic Romanians, and we have Roman Catholics who are ethnic Hungarians. But we ha will have the honor, as far as I know, that the Archbishop of the Hungarian Roman Catholics will be here uh, today with us at the opening the uh, ceremony in the church. Um, you can see they worship in the same way, yet structurally they are two different, well, basically church entities. The Romanian-speaking Roman Catholic Church with its sent in Eucharist and Mass, so the eastern, northern part of today's Romania, and to have the Hungarian-speaking Roman Catholics with their center in Tulapenir Padre Abad. We have a very tiny community and Drinking community of Luther's, uh, followers of Martin Luther's. Well, we have the fraction of the Saxons that still remain here in Transylvania, usually around North Sebat, speaking. Uh, and uh, there's a small Hungarian speaking Lutheran church also in Baltas. The majority of the Hungarian speaking Transylvania, so around 500,000 people or before or Calvinists or Presbyterian. Choose whatever name you want to call it. Uh, they are the majority of the uh, Hungarians live here. They're predominantly Hungarian in their language and in their community. So 99% of the membership of here, 500,000 ethnic Hungarians. And then you have the Unitarians, us. We are also 99% Hungarian. We are, we live in a double minority. We are ethnic we are Hungarians living in Romania, and we are also Unitarians living among other denominations. I will talk about the number of the Unitarians separate. We have Greek Catholics who are uh, predominantly Romanian. The Greek Catholics is a mixture between the old Orthodox uh, denomination and the Roman Catholic system of the uh, and the Catholic Church of Romania has had what has had what foundation uh, uh, impact on the national character and the development of the Romanian people living in Transylvania. We are very important to look at the history of the Romanians here, yet they were persecuted during communism but made legal. So the Greek Catholic Church was put outside of the law during the communists. And we have Baptists who are Romanian and Hungarian in their nationality. We have Adventists, Romanians, Hungarian, and Roma people. We have Jehovah's Witnesses, and we have the plethora of other denominations, groups, and uh, um, religious uh, uh, churches living here. You might ask yourself, we have talked about the Jewish people yet, we cannot see them on the list. And this is a tragedy that I want to talk about, Cecil. It is a tragedy of the 20th century. Here in this city, we have this beautiful Ibrahim event now. Before the Second World War, there were seven synagogues where the Jewish people lived or sat in this small city. And this was the case all around the cities of Transport. Thriving, large Jewish communities. It feeds Romanians, Saxons, and Hungarians for hundreds of years. That came the Second World War, where these people were brought together, put in wagons, parts, training parts that were made for animals, 
and we were taken at so much time. Only a very, or very small amount of people returned. From these people that have returned, many chose not to die. It was so bad. Face the people who did not. They were gathered around and taken to their back. So they, they went to Israel. They went to other parts of the world. And only a fraction of those people decided to come back. Now in Kuroshlad, there is only one Jewish community with around 20 something basically added. These are the ones that uh, decided, or maybe their parents decided to return to this place. And this is something that we are not very proud. But this is something that we have to know and we have to realize in order to learn from the mistakes that have to be. It's not only our mistake, it's the mistake of the Western world, mistake of Europe. And the biggest mistake obviously comes to the ones acting made this happen. But we cannot say that all the people who did not, or the religious leaders who did not, do not share the faith. In this context, there is also some good news. If you look at the uh, acts and registers that we have in different congregations, not only the Unitarians, but also the Catholics in former times, we'll see in the 40s, in the early 40s, slightly important, many, many adult baptisms. The uh, baptism of heaven. Now, Nine is something for several perspectives of people of Jewish uh, descent who tried to become Christian and thus somehow not to or forced to be put under the laws that the Nazi governments had done at the time. It did not work. But the churches tried at least this tried that instance. Yet, this is tragic as well. Something that we need. Now let's talk about the uh, uh, material translation. Our denomination, uh, our uh, um, um, uh, church. And before we uh, um, talk about uh, Unitarianism in a very, very short manner, I have to introduce to you the, our first bishop of founder, David Fenex, who Obviously, he goes by many names. Uh, he was Francis Christophanes, if he wrote in Latin. But when he was born, because he was of Saxon descent, he was called Franz Herbert. Hungarians were referred to him as God in Paris. And English speaking people might know him from Francis Day. So, as everything, we have many names for everyone. He was born here in Hurushval baptized the Roman Catholic, he passed through all the stages of the Protestant Reformation, becoming Lutheran, being elected the first bishop of the Lutherans in Transylvania, then switching to Calvinism, becoming Reformed and becoming the first bishop of the Reformed Church in Transylvania, then from the uh, 1560s, the mid-1560s, becoming the first anti-Unitarian or Unitarian saying that nowhere in the Bible you can find the dogma of the Holy Trinity as presented in Christian theology, and he thus is the founder and first mission of the Unitarianism here in Palestine. This is the center of the Unitarians, and the congregation that worships in the church where this is the longest still existing Unitarian congregation in the world. The first Unitarian sermon here in the city was set in 1566, and from 1566 on, there has been no Sunday on which there was no Unitarian sermons open here that are being published on. Today, we will have the chance Francis David put on the Lord's table when we walk the church. We will not have much time to explain what God is, but that's a single that chalice has been in the property of the Unitarian Church since its foundation. Everyone, every, I'd say, important person, leader of this church, 
at some point in their lives, that trend is what and trend what from that as we do doing with me. So that's a symbol, a symbol of when it's. We have to talk about John Sigismund, the first guy, only unitary one who the world, was Prince of Transylvania, and because of that, it went and he became a year thus basically uh, uh, helping Unitarians have its roots strength here in Transylvania. And we have freedom. In 1568, here in the nearby where a government court, not church leaders, but the political leaders of the then separate state of Transylvania were faced with a very different uh, problem. You had Roman Catholics and Protestants. And Roman Catholics and Protestants, like in every country of Europe, were preparing for war. You decide which in our world should we be strong. So that's what they learned from the Western parties. Because you had bloodshed in all around Europe because of religion. And now these politicians had to decide what to do. And they made, they made, because they get the call. And no person is allowed to interfere in the relationship between God and people. Let the people decide what way do they want to worship God. Because they know better. This is the famous act of religious tolerance, for instance, which goes sense before any other idea of religious tolerance that we would appear in Europe. And we're proud of that. As the birthplace of the, this religious tolerance is translated and somewhat our human community. This made it possible that here there was no religious law in the 16th century. Unitarianism today, our small, yet we try to say strong church, uh, is one persecuted deal of being the communist. Well, like all the other uh, denominations, we had our buildings, lands, and properties taken away by the Romanian state. Ministers were only allowed to have Sunday worship, but nothing else. Our intellectual beginners were visible for things that would seem ridiculous today, and the communist state tried everything to silence the religious voice of the people, and the small Unitarian church was struck very much in After 1989, the fall of communism, we tried somehow to mitigate our momentum, uh, and it's still trapped. It's not. You have to rebuild many years that were taken place, and that is not missing, but we tried. And hopefully, we succeed finally. In 2012, we had a very important moment for us. The Trinity of Spiano broke the Hungarian in the Church of the Hungarian Church of Hungary, and the Transylvanian Union. In the 21st century, managed to heal the wound that was made by this treaty. And now the Hungarian European Church is in the prime of that. We're very happy. We have around 50,000 members, all happy Hungarians. So you see, we are one tenth of the Calvinist Church. Small, you think. We have around 124 parishes. And if my calculations are correct, we are not. We have 136 ministers serving these congregations and other parts of church. We are a small community, but uh, we're a proud community. We want to be an active community. We want to look at our best and learn from it. Learn from it in order to use it to have a future in front of us. Because if there's one thing that we learn is that what you have done and what you have behind is something that is foundation and will shape. And one of the teachings that is foundational from our history is this idea of religious politics, freedom, of acceptance, of dialogue, real, actual dialogue between people at the Thank you very much for your, your impression.